I'm Anthony from The Basement Reef, and welcome to The Basement Reef at Home, Episode 2. We're a retail aquatic pet store and houseplant shop located in Columbia, Missouri, but this is our series where we focus on my reef keeping efforts at home. In Episode 1, we talked about this cube right behind me here, and we decided to call it the Oddball LPS Cube. If you're interested in it, please go back and check out that video. But today, we're going to be talking about this other tank over here. And this is a tank that came about because my wife wanted a tank. So this one, we're just going to call Sarah's tank, at least until we have a better idea of the direction of the tank, then we might give it a more descriptive name than that. Now obviously this tank isn't looking too good at the moment. It has a massive cyanobacteria or red slime issue, and that's the primary thing that I want to focus on with this video today. How I think that came about, and how I'm going to approach dealing with it. But before we get to that, I'll get into a little bit of the specifics about the tank because I have some opinions there too. To begin with, I'd like to talk a little bit about the tank itself. It's a little Fluval Evo. And if you're not familiar with that, uh, Fluval is a brand that makes a number of both freshwater and marine products. And I have mixed feelings about them. Uh, a lot of their products are really great. Uh, the tank itself on the Evo has a really nice form factor and it's built really well. Uh, but when you buy it, it comes with a light that grows some corals, but it's not the best marine light. And the pump isn't necessarily what I would consider to be an appropriate pump for a marine tank. Uh, and the problem with this is that oftentimes people walk into a little mom and pop pet store or a big box pet store, and there's all these legacy freshwater brands like Aquion and Marine Land with just your, your basic little freshwater setups. And then the only marine products that anyone sees in those stores are things like these fluvals. And they're advertised as an all-in-one complete setup. And they're all right to get started, but people walk out of that store with these thinking that they bought a really nice marine product. And really, it's kind of an entry-level marine product. I understand that really that's the point of the product. It's meant to be at an affordable price point as an entry-level marine aquarium. The problem though is that the stores you usually find it aren't your marine specialty stores. Like I said, they're your big box stores, your mom and pop stores. So if somebody thinks they walked out of there with something really awesome because they don't see the nicer marine brands next to it to understand that they've really just grabbed something entry level. Uh, and so then people pick up something like that. Uh, they find their way into my store when they're ready to start stocking corals. And uh, despite my best advice, they will insist on loading it up with uh, every type of coral under the sun and then they wonder why they're not growing and then you have to explain to them that the $300 tank they just bought doesn't have a light capable of growing more than a handful of corals and that's a tough conversation to tell somebody that their very first step into the hobby they've already wasted money in a number of ways I really do like the tank though so some things that might be cool to see is if they offered the tank alone without the light and all of that, or if they stepped up the light to a true marine capable light, uh, even if that would raise the price point a little bit, I do think that would make these Fluval Evos a legitimately better product. A lot of my customers do run these though, and I came across a used one. My wife was wanting a tank, so I was like, you know, I'll jump in and get a little bit more hands-on experience with these tanks. Very next thing I noticed is that the return pump is just not good enough I haven't replaced this one yet, but I'm going to do that because that's something this tank definitely needs is just better flow. Uh, I also would like to add a circulation pump. We'll get to that in future videos though. Today I'm just introducing this tank, how we got here, and giving you some thoughts on this red slime problem before we tackle it. Now as far as the light that I replaced the stock light with on this, uh, I have what's called an AE60. Uh, you find these on Amazon, and this is another light that uh, I decided to try because a number of my customers have come into the store saying, hey, this is a real nice cheap light that I got. Uh, it grows corals really well and it's at a decent price point. Uh, and that's definitely true, but you're missing a few features with this light. It has some controllability. Uh, you can amp up the levels of white and blue. There's like five stages of each. It has a built-in timer, but you can only put it in increments of I believe six hours. There's again multiple levels to that timer and the timer just starts when you plug the light in. So for a controllable light, there's not a ton of controllability here, but I do have to admit 
it looks nice over the tank, it does grow some corals, and it's more powerful than you would think. Definitely, definitely check this out with the PAR meter after you put it over your tank, because there's a good chance if you're just trying to cue it in visually, you're gonna roast your corals. That leads me to my next point. I'm actually going to challenge other store owners here to step up just a little bit. Lots of stores will rent out a PAR meter or let you borrow one for a hefty deposit. And I'm just gonna tell you what I do in my store. Uh, a lot of people say this is crazy because PAR meters are very expensive, but I just let people borrow it on the honor system. You know, probably not the first time you walk into my store. If I've never seen you before, I'm not gonna let you walk out with the $600 PAR meter. But if you're in once or twice, I'm gonna let you leave the store with that PAR meter, no questions asked. And here's why, because if you dial in your tank better to where you're having more success, money is going to come back to me through you buying more for your tank because you buy more for your tank when you're experiencing success. If you're not being successful in this hobby, you're not gonna throw more money at it. I'm a store, I love it when people are spending money and it just ends up being a really nice beneficial relationship where they get to dial in their tank at no cost to them and the benefit, again, is their success equals more purchases at my store. I've never had anybody damage or steal the PAR meter, uh, but if that were to happen, uh, honestly, I believe that the returns have already been uh, tenfold. I've let dozens of customers borrow this PAR meter and it's led to really great relationships with my customers. Uh, so that's my little challenge to other store owners, is maybe take a look at how you're handling some of these things and how you can develop better relationships with your customers by offering them low cost tools to be more successful. All right, so the red slime, what's up with that, right? Well, to be honest with you, I've done dozens of tanks before, large installs, little Pico jars, every type of saltwater tank you could imagine. But something I've done very, very few times is start completely with scratch from base rock. My secret sauce has kind of been to roll off of the same bacteria from the same rocks for years. If I start up a new tank, I take some pieces off of the old tank. At the store, I have a giant live rock bin that I toss pieces of rock into all the time. If we break down a tank and the rock looks nice and clean, I throw it in there. So it's just really nice cultured rock with a nice robust biome. It's a completely different experience from starting with dead dry rock. Sometimes I've started with dry rock and it's worked really well, but this tank, it has not gone well for me. The fish have been doing fine in there. We got the tank cycled just fine as far as handling ammonia, but that's a low hurdle. That's the very first bar to clear for the tank. It's also growing coral just fine, and there's no hair algae or really any other pest issue besides the cyanobacteria. But this cyanobacteria problem is awful. I can blow it away, do close to 100% water change, and it comes back within 24 to 48 hours. It grows throughout the day. You can see that in the morning it's not so bad, but then by midday it's just in thick sheets across the glass, across the back of the tank, just everywhere. So what are we gonna do about it? Well, a common solution is to treat with ChemiClean. Uh, that works really well, it knocks the problem out but a lot of people say that that's treating the problem, not the cause of the problem. And that's true to an extent. Uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, a lot of people will also say that, oh, it's always a nutrient issue. It's always a nutrient issue. Uh, I disagree with that. Cyanobacteria loves to grow anywhere it can. It doesn't need all that many nutrients to grow. It's photosynthetic, so the light plays a large component in it. And you can have a tank that doesn't have any visible cyanobacteria in it. And if you were to look that water under a microscope, you could eventually find examples of cyanobacteria in it. So why does it grow in some tanks and not other tanks, even if most of your main parameters, your nitrates, your phosphates, are dialed in just fine? Well, I think that it has to do with the biome of the tank. And this brings me to a really cool video series that Ryan Batchelor of BRS TV has been posting. Uh, he's midway through his experiment, because that's what it is, is a large scale experiment, uh, the likes of which you don't see often in the reef keeping community. And he calls this uh, the ultimate biome experiment or something along those lines. I, I definitely recommend checking this video series out. Essentially what Ryan did is set up 15 different tanks with the exact same equipment 
but cycle them in different ways. Uh, starting with different types of media from different tanks, uh, using different types of bacteria products available across the industry, starting with dry rock, starting with damp shipped live rock, starting with wet shipped live rock. Uh, most ways that most people would think of to cycle a tank, uh, he tested them against each other. Uh, this is as close as you get to a controlled experiment in the reef keeping hobby. Uh, there's way too much going on to ever do a true controlled experiment, uh, but this stuff is awesome. The amount of money that BRS had to have spent producing this experiment uh, is astounding and the results honestly kind of changed the way that I think about reef keeping. And if you're anything like me, I think that it might change your mind too. Uh, I've always known that the biome of the tank is important, diversity is important, that's why I have always used things from established tanks to keep my personal what I call my personal biome going across multiple tanks because I know it's good, I know that it works well, and I know that tanks do well with this biome. So what do I mean by biome? Uh, it's, it's basically everything that lives in the tank. Uh, if you think about the tank as constantly being in a state of warfare, in a battle, that's really what's going on in our reef tanks right uh, down to the microscopic organisms, all the photosynthetic pests, the desirable photosynthetic organisms, uh, copepods, flatworms, everything you can think of is all battling for real estate in the reef, even our corals. And when people talk about a reef tank taking a while to mature, really what they're talking about is a reef tank taking a long time to reach an equilibrium in the biome. But not every equilibrium is the same exact end point. It can be an equilibrium where you don't have an obvious problem, but it can still be missing some things. So again, this tank handles most pests just fine. Bubble algae can get in there, it doesn't really take off. Hair algae can get in there, it doesn't really take off. But this cyanobacteria, no matter what I do, just takes off. So my big takeaway from Ryan's experiment was that the tanks that did the best at least from my interpretation of it, were the ones that he used pieces of rubble and things like that from the dark areas of established tanks that don't have problems with cyanobacteria. This is interesting to me because a lot of people don't think about, is it important if I take things from the dark part of the tank or the light part of the tank? Uh, and that was one of the major game changers for me personally when I heard Ryan say that, like a light bulb went off in my head. Uh, obviously, different types of organisms are going to live in the dark parts of the tank compared to the light parts of the tank, and it's not that unrealistic to believe that some of the predators of things that live in the light part of the tank like to hang out most of the day in the dark part of the tank. And so pulling things from the dark part of the tank might make a huge difference. So my thought here, the very first thing I want to try, just to put Ryan's experiments to a little bit of a practical application in my house because I think that that's that's how these things develop that's how reef keeping develops uh, somebody doesn't just come up with an idea and say hey this works for me and then the next day everybody says that's awesome and then everybody's doing reef keeping differently the next day uh, no that's not how it works uh, if you see something that you like uh, you need to try it and if it works for you, you need to share that too. And eventually with the preponderance of the evidence, we can say, this is a really cool new breakthrough for reef keeping. Uh, so we're gonna see if something as simple as pulling some rubble from the sump of a system that doesn't have cyanobacteria and putting it into the dark area of this tank here can possibly get us over our cyano problem. So let's think about a donor tank for this rubble. Our soft coral tank springs to mind, but it has a little bit of cyanobacteria. Our 90 gallon tank is pretty clean, but it has some orange diatoms that I don't want to introduce to this tank. So that brings me to our coral frag system, and I think this is our winner. It's mostly free of any major photosynthetic pests. And this tank is connected to it, and we use this as sort of our landing zone. And oftentimes, hair algae or cyanobacteria on a rock from a customer teardown or something like that will just melt off of it in a couple of days. So I think there's a good chance the biome here is exactly what we're looking for. Additionally, there's plenty of rubble in the dark part of the system. So let's grab some, bag it up, head back to the house, and see if this can't be exactly what we need to fix the cyanobacteria. 
we'll simply toss this rubble, harvested from the dark part of our frag system, right into the back chamber of this Fluval Evo. And that's where we'll stop our video today. Could it really be that simple to get over our cyanobacteria problem? And more importantly, could this possibly be a practical application of Ryan's biome test? We'll keep taking care of this tank just like we have before. And remember, the cyanobacteria problem was not budging. So I believe that if it starts to come around, that'll be a positive sign that maybe bringing the biome from our sump over to this tank is what did the trick. Anyways, thank you so much for watching this and please tune in to our next episode of The Basement Reef at Home. We'll be talking about this tank again and how we're gonna turbocharge the photosynthesis. If you enjoyed this content, please check out the other videos on our channel and also please like this video and subscribe to our channel. Those are the two biggest things anyone can do to help us grow today, so we would definitely appreciate it. Thanks.